Major news coming down in the National Basketball Association on Wednesday as the league announced that Toronto Raptors forward Jonte Porter has been banned from the league after an investigation revealed that he had disclosed confidential information to bettors, limited his participation in at least one game while he was with the Raptors, and bet on NBA games while playing in the G League. We're going to talk about the impact of this sports betting scandal. We're going to do it with an Emmy Award-winning freelance journalist who recently wrote an article about the surge in sports in betting in women's sports. Her name is Kavitha Davidson, and she joins me now. Kavitha, how's it going? I'm doing all right. Thanks, Dexter. I'm glad to have you here to talk about this. Kavitha, I want to start with this. Can you just start by providing an overview of the key details in Jonte Porter's sports betting scandal and the immediate impact it will have on the NBA? Yeah, so like you said, he gave information about his health to a known better. Um, that was, a, I believe, on a, a March 20th game, uh, and the league launched its investigation on March 24th. Um, another person who was an associate of Jonte Porter's who knew that information placed an $80,000 same game parlay that featured unders on Porter stats. And that bet would have paid out $1.1 million. That was obviously extremely suspicious, so that bet did not get paid out. Um, he also bet on NBA games as a G League player. He bet on at least 13 games using someone else's accounts. Uh, these bets ranged from $15 to $22,000. They totaled, they totaled a little over $54,000. Um, and it's important to note that none of those bets involved games in which Porter played, but he did bet on the Raptors to lose on at least one, one game, and he, he lost that bet. Um, um, so and then, then in another instance, I believe in that March 20th game, he also limited his playing time. He, I, I believe he played only three minutes in that game, um, saying that he was ill um, and, and the better obviously had some bets placed on his unders. So there's a lot of there's there's a lot here and it's kind of a worst case scenario for the NBA. You know, Adam Silver used the words cardinal sin. And that is, you know, that is what uh, what this kind of amounts to. Yeah, it does, and it's really bad. And for people that maybe don't understand there, it's basically, look, inside information that's going on here when you think about it in terms of sports with the information he was giving and betting on the game. So not good. Now, Well, it's insider information, yep. and it's also, you know, if he's, if he's taking himself out of games, it's insider information, absolutely, but it's also trying to affect the outcome of games, which is right. always the number one fear um, of betting and corruption, you know, dating all the way back to the 1918 Black Sox. Yeah, you're right, and that's it. It's also affecting the outcome of games, which compromises the integrity of games, which we'll hear from a lot of commissioners, including Adam Silver. So, Kavitha, now you've got this ban from the NBA. What precedent does the NBA set with the severity of Porter's punishment in comparison to past instances of misconduct by players? Yeah, I mean, there have been other NBA players who have been banned for life. This is the first, um, you know, for, for, for betting of this nature, I believe. Um, other lifetime bans have ar arisen from things like uh, drug convictions uh, and, and, and violence and, and the such. But this does set an incredible precedent. You know, I think that Adam Silver is genuine when he says that he will not tolerate this kind of behavior. I think that, you know, it, every league recognizes that this is an existential threat to their games because if players uh, engage in this type of activity at this level, um, and you know this is a, a name that not a lot of NBA fans know, but you know let's say it's a more high-profile player, then that does represent a severe threat to the health of everyone's leagues and everyone's billions of dollars. Yeah, absolutely does for sure. And you mentioned Adam Silver, the NBA commissioner, and years ago he advocated for legal sports betting as a means to increase transparency. Has this premise held up based on recent events? I mean, I think it has. Honestly, I, I was one of those people dating back at least 10 years who also did believe in and still do believe in um, in legalization for the purpose of regulation. Um, that being said, you know, the United States has not done a great job in in enacting some some stop gaps that we've seen overseas in Europe and in Australia, um, which are which are places that have had legal sports betting for years, if not decades, and have seen um, corruption pitfalls and public health gambling addiction pitfalls and things like that. So I do think that you know he meant it, and I do think that. 
the only way to regulate and to bring this behavior above ground is to is to have legalized it. But you know the way that we've gone about implementing it has not been has not been particularly effective, um, especially in the piecemeal way that we have state by state legislation. We don't have a singular federal legislation, um, you know, dictating how how we don't even have a singular federal legislation about whether sports betting is legal. So the way that this has been rolled out is uh, is a little bit problematic. Now I will say that sports betting industry officials, um, sports league officials will tell you that the fact that John T. Porter was flagged by their monitoring services is a sign that the system is working. And I don't I don't disagree with that necessarily. I do think that very clearly there are other things that can be done. And Adam Silver did talk about the need to tighten and bolster uh, their, their regulatory framework. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go next with this, because in a statement announcing Porter's ban, Silver mentioned the need for a revised regulatory framework. What specific changes might we as sports fans and consumers expect to see in how bets on NBA games are managed? Well, from, from a monitoring standpoint, I'm not sure what more can really be done except for putting more bodies on this, because very clearly something something was missed with, with John T. Porter. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but just yesterday, um, the Action Network reported that uh, that Porter had placed at least a thousand bets previously to joining the Raptors um, out of an account in Colorado. He placed a more than a thousand bets of millions of dollars on sports not involving basketball, so not the NBA or college basketball, but there was chronic betting behavior before he signed with the Raptors. And that Colorado-based account was a clo was closed a few weeks before he signed his contract with the Raptors. So it seems as if leagues and monitoring services need to add to their um, defensive monitoring stance, and they need to be proactive before players sign contracts in, in, in monitoring and, and characterizing the betting activity of these players. The other thing that um, has, been, has been proposed, which is interesting, Interesting is prohibiting two-way players from placing bets, or prohibiting sports books from accepting bets from two-way players, which this would have uh, would have combated Jonte Porter's actions. Yeah, it would for sure. And I think the big thing you mentioned there is that we know in everything it's better to be proactive than reactive. And you wonder if we'll see some of the changes there to protect players and things around this. But there's going to be a thought, Kavitha, from some fans as to how could Porter have done this or how did he not know that he would be caught? What measures can be taken to better educate athletes on the risk and consequences of participating in sports betting? Yeah, I do have a lot of sympathy for athletes, um, especially college athletes, frankly, because we've seen some issues um, mostly stemming from, like I said, the fact that there isn't a singular piece of legislation on this. And, and some athletes don't don't know all the rules. Now, I don't think that was the case with John Day Porter. John Day Porter absolutely knew that he couldn't bet on NBA games. And he absolutely knew he couldn't bet on his own team uh, to lose uh, or he couldn't bet on his own team at all. But I do think that, you know, rookie transition program needs to have a lot more education on on betting. And this is, like I said, a, a, a public health situation. You know, I'm not uh, a mental health expert or a psychiatrist, so I will not diagnose Jonte Porter with a gambling addiction. But if he's placing more than a thousand bets from 2021 to 2023, that's at least chronic behavior. Um, and we do know that gambling is extremely addictive and that some of the regulatory framework and some of the proposals that other countries um, have started to enact really mirror um, some of the prohibitions that were eventually placed on big tobacco. So that should tell you just how addictive gambling can be. No, oh, fantastic point there and something to look at in terms of history and how that might be in context with what is going on today with gambling. Final thing for me here, Kavitha, when you reflect on all aspects of this incident, do you believe sports betting is ultimately beneficial or harmful to sports fans and the integrity of sports leagues in America? So this is a really hard question for me, because like I said, I did and still do believe that legalizing sports betting is good. Um, it's it's better than illegal sports betting. It's better than offshore books. It's better than underground uh, anything involving, you know, probably shadier characters. I think that legalizing sports betting is and was the right move. My personal feeling about sports betting, and I'm saying this as somebody who I don't bet on sports mostly because of, you know, I, I don't really have an interest in it, but also because I think it's a professional conflict. Um, I don't like what I've seen anecdotally from what sports betting has done to the experience of watching sports. And what, I'll, what I mean by that is it absolutely does and has 
driven engagement, increased viewership. I wrote about this in the context of women's sports. Sports betting has been positive for the bottom line of women's sports, as it has been for all other sports. But the type of engagement, again, this is me personally saying this, does not sit well with me. Literally just yesterday, I was sitting at my local bar and I was next to a group of, of dudes from Boston, you know, and I'm a native New Yorker who's about to say that Boston is a fantastic sports city. Um, but they were literally taught, one of them literally said, I don't find joy in watching sports unless I have a bet placed on it. And I think that's really sad as somebody who loves sports for the sport and for all kinds of reasons for city pride, for personal pride, college, well, all, all kinds of things. I think it's, it's a little bit sad that we might be getting to a point where the only thing that people are watching sports for might be betting. And I don't think that that's particularly good for the industry. I'd happen to agree with you. I don't think it's good if we get to that point and we're already seeing some of the pressures that players talked about hearing from fans in terms of if they don't win or don't hit on a bet. We've heard coaches talk about this, J.B. Bickerstaff with the Cleveland Cavaliers. So it's very interesting where we're headed. So much to talk about sports betting and how it is impacting sports. And obviously with this Jante Porter scandal going down today in the NBA. That is Kavitha Davidson, fantastic freelance journalist. Check out her work. Kavitha I knew you were the great person to talk to about this. I appreciate you and your time, and we'll do it again soon, hopefully in some other subject that might be a little bit happier.